come to we get this. Yeah. didn't overtake them, so they were doing about 10 miles an hour. <laughs> well, that's what the new rules say. No, they're allowed to fill the lane. So a motorcycle over two all of us. <laughs> I don't know where they come in the hierarchy of um, rights. In between cars and rights. Yeah, and you couldn't pass because you would be... Too close. But, but you know, I mean, the, the, the cyclists... They should. And, they and should. They should. I mean, there's a comp there's a, I mean, a balance, and, and, isn't it? And that's and that's in the highway code. Is it right? Ah, yeah. Yeah. And then you
Thank you, Sheila, for going to get them. <laughs> Thank you, Sheila, for going to <laughs> <laughs> for going to get that. Much appreciated. I'm coming through here. Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to the uh, Cafe Style Service. Nice to see you all here. It's been a busy day. Uh, for me anyway. Uh, a good kirking service this morning um, and a good number there and good to see you. So a good number here as well. We have some intimations we're just going to go through uh, and then we'll... Morag is singing in praise gathering and there's a wee video to just remind us of that so just flick through the slides. Is it on? Is, is it switched on? That's it. So watch next week, Sunday morning, 11 o'clock at Trinity is the only morning service because it's a South grouping service with our fellow South grouping churches, Trinity and Cavers and Curtin. It will be recorded and broadcast later. Discipleship explored 12th of June, 3 o'clock. And here we are. Rehearsals in Edinburgh, and there are about 60 of us rehearsing in Edinburgh. There are 40 rehearsing in Perth, and the rest are rehearsing in Glasgow. People are coming from as far away from Shetland, Northern Ireland, and Cornwall for those rehearsals. Um, and th these are our concerts coming up at the end of June. So um, it promises to be a fantastic night of praise. Um, there will also be a gospel message, so it's a great opportunity to invite a friend along who might um, be good for them to hear the gospel. Um, 400 members of the choir uh, from 180 churches That's, uh, it promises to be very good that's good if you want to know more you can get tickets from the box office but if you want have got any questions then please ask you to us <coughs> so the relevant one for us really is 7.30 7 o'clock seven in Edinburgh in the Usher Hall, 25th of June, Saturday the 25th of June, 7 o'clock. It would be good if a number of us were able to go. We certainly plan to go. So thanks, Morag, for drawing that to attention. I've been to many of these over the years, and they are excellent, excellent concerts. So we're going to sing now. We'll remain seated. Holy Spirit, we welcome you.
Let us pray. Lord God, our Father, we bow before you. We worship you as the living God. We seek your face as you call us to do. We thank you that we can come into your presence because of what you have done for us through Jesus Christ, your Son, by his blood shed for us on the cross. By his death and resurrection, you have opened up the way, that living way for us to come to you. You make us your children, and your Holy Spirit is the one who achieves all that in us. We bless you for him on this day of Pentecost when we celebrate you pouring out your Holy Spirit on the church. We give you thanks that he is the same today. And as we gather here, uh, he is, you're present with us by your Spirit. So we open ourselves to you. We welcome you as we have just been singing. Lord, we do as we have just sung there, want you unreservedly to have your way in our lives and in your church. So we bow before you and now we give ourselves to you as we come to worship you. We give you thanks for your church, which is precious to you. Your son bought it with his own blood. Your purpose is to make your wonderful, manifold wisdom made known, to make it known to the powers and authorities in the heavenly realms so that all may see how great you are by what you have done in your church made up of the likes of sinners saved by grace like ourselves. So strengthen your church, achieve your purposes in it. In these challenging days, Lord, we pray for your glory and the salvation of many. Strengthen us, strengthen your people. Glorify your name this evening. Cleanse us from all sin. May we know your forgiveness. Thank you, Lord. Hear our prayers as we bring them in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to sing a song that may not be so well known to us. You are holy. You are holy. We'll play it through once. Eh? Just play it. Just play it. Uh, yes. Yes, you know, so repeat both parts and then to go back. But we'll just um, play it right through once, including the repeats. the first part and the second part, then we'll go back and do the first part again.
We're going to have our Bible reading now, uh, which should come up on the screen. Welcome to everyone uh, uh, watching, joining in worship online at home. I hope you're seeing and hearing me loud and clear. Of course, they can't answer, but uh, it's <laughs> nice to have you with us. Forgot to welcome you earlier, so blessings on you as you join us here. So I'm reading this evening, continuing with this challenging um, part of First Corinthians, Chapter 5, verses 9 to 13. Paul says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the people of this world who are immoral, or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I am writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or slanderer, a drunkard or swindler. Do not even eat with such people. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked person from among you. Amen. We're going to sing now a more traditional hymn um, for about the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Sorry, Joe. Breathe on me, breath of God. Thanks to our praise band. It's great to have them playing, isn't it? <laughs> Should learn more, Ike. Thank you.
In preparing for this evening, I was thinking about something a friend said to me the other week. They were criticizing their minister's preaching. Um, He only tells us what the passage says, but I'm looking for something new, something I don't know. And I must say, as I thought about that criticism, it troubled me in a number of ways. First, I'm just so grateful for preaching that faithfully adheres to what the Bible says and doesn't go off in some strange new departure or says, well, that's what that says, but this is what we now say. Of course, what is said needs to be unpacked, explained, illustrated, and applied. Uh, And I I know the preacher that's being criticized, so I'm sure he does that. I know he does that. And yes, God is always shedding fresh light in and through his word, by his Holy Spirit. But I suppose what troubled me most The power of God's word is in what is actually said, isn't it? (laughs) The Holy Spirit has inspired it, breathed it out so that it's there. And then we read it, we preach it, we proclaim it, we follow it. What is actually said, the clarity of scripture it's called. There are some things that are hard to understand and we need to wrestle with those. But it's what is actually what is actually said that matters. So I'm left wondering why my friend seems to have got past that basic and glorious reality. How is this relating to this evening? Well, the challenge in our reading tonight is not really so much understanding what Paul says, although we need to do some work to see what that is that he's saying. What is the challenge? The challenge is that what Paul is saying uh, is hugely difficult. We might not particularly like it. Uh, We might not want to have to do it. There's a challenge, not in what is said, but in what it calls on us to do. So with these opening thoughts, let's see what Paul is saying here. It follows on from what we looked at last time in the cafe style service at the beginning of May. Um, Remember there was that man uh, Paul was referring to who was in a sexual relationship with his father's wife, understood understood to be his stepmother, not his own mother, a a woman that his wife, his father had married again uh, and he had this sexual relationship with her and it was incestuous in terms of biblical teaching and in terms of the law of the time. But the church, for some reason, was proud of what was going on. Paul was aghast, and his instruction was very clear, and this was so hard for us to hear, but this is what he said, that the man should be put out of the church fellowship. Excommunication, we call it. Separated from the privileges of being a church member as a proper discipline measure. Paul instructed the church, hand this man over to Satan, so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and the spirit saved on the day of the Lord. So he's not to have the privileges of being part of the church family. He is back out in the world, so to speak, where Satan has his domain, under the lordship of God's lordship, of course, but he's out there in the world. What's the worst that can happen to him there? That he will die there. But the aim of the drastic action is clear, that his spirit will be saved on the day of the Lord. Paul's hope is that this drastic action will bring the man to his senses. He'll repent and turn back to Christ and find restoration. The aim of discipline is always restoration. Hopefully he will come back into church membership sooner or later. But the apostle now turns to deal with something in another letter. He sent the Corinthian church, which isn't in the New Testament. So there was at least three letters he sent to, uh, we've only got first and second Corinthians, but there was another one earlier than first Corinthians. And the Corinthian church seemed to have misunderstood something he said in that letter. He'd said, he told them not to associate with sexually immoral people. The word translated associate means 
being mixed up with, mingling with, having regular or prolonged contact and interaction with someone. And I was just saw last time, sexual immorality. The word sexual immorality basically means having a sexual relationship outside marriage between a man and a woman. Porneo. For whatever reason, whether through a simple misunderstanding or through the turning away from Paul's authority that we've seen happening early in Corinthians, um, the church have put a negative, maybe they've put a negative interpretation on his words because of that turning away from Paul's authority. We don't know. But whatever the reason is, they seem to have thought that Paul was saying that they weren't to have to mingle with, have regular prolonged contact with people outside the church who were acting in sinful ways. And to think that Paul would be saying that, that Christians should not associate with sinful people outside the church, shows a total misunderstanding of the gospel. Paul corrects him, as we'll see in a minute. He didn't mean that at all. But to think that Paul was saying that we shouldn't be mingling, associating with people outside the church shows a total misunderstanding of the gospel. Jesus came to be the friend of sinners. He was perfectly pure, sinless himself, but mixed freely. He was criticized, wasn't he, for being the friend of sinners, for associating with people that you shouldn't be associating with, tax collectors, people who had failed morally, who knew they had failed. So when you couple that misunderstanding that for some reason they thought you shouldn't be mixing with anyone outside the church, a kind of isolationism, if you couple that with what's been happening in the church, the condoning and happy acceptance of sexual immorality within the church, the picture gets even more concerning. Of a church that sees God's grace as allowing sinful activity within the church, by God's grace, but condemning it in those outside uh, of being hypercritical of the wrong things that we see around us in society, but for some reason, totally accepting of what's going on inside the church. A low moral standard within the church, the highest of standards for those outside. It's all the wrong way around. If we act like that, people from outside the church who know that sexual morality is wrong will be perplexed by the church condoning it. And they will see a church that's critical of them, looking down on them. It is a church that is hypocritical and judgmental. So Paul comes in with this strong corrective teaching. He says, if we are not to associate with people outside the church who are sinful, we will have to leave the world altogether. It's an impossibility not to be rubbing shoulders with sinners because everyone is saved by grace in Christ, but those outside the church, how could we possibly avoid it? It would take a level of self-isolation, of spiritual lockdown that would be completely untenable and impossible. So that's very easy to understand, isn't it, that part of it? Quite easy to apply. We are to be engaged with those outside the church. We are to be fully involved in this world and the culture around us. As Jesus said, in the world, but not of it. Come back to that shortly. But then we come to the real challenge for us this evening. Paul doesn't just correct the Corinthians for their false understanding of what the relationship with those outside the church should be. He corrects their understanding of what the relationships in the church should be. He says... But now I'm writing you that you must not associate, mix, mingle, have prolonged contact and relationship with anyone who calls himself a brother or sister but is sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater, a slanderer, a drunkard, or a swindler. With such a person, do not even eat. So how are we to respond to that? There's the challenge. Let's just look at the list. Can you, there should be lists come up, uh, Joe, if you could. Verse 9, this, this is just to, to look at these lists that Paul gives. They increase in number every time of what this sinful activity, behavior, that we have not to associate with people who are like this. 
Here's his list. The first one is just one item, sexually immoral. And then, verse 10, just verse 10, verse 10 sexually immoral, greedy, swindler, idolater. And then verse 11, sexually immoral, greedy, idolater, slanderer, drunkard, swindler. So there's additions made to the list every time in this very short passage. Uh, it, it, Paul's referring to a settled pattern of sinful activity in general. His lists are illustrative rather than exhaustive. And here's another list. This is, this is from Jesus himself in Mark 7, 21, 22. He's speaking about the evil that comes from our human hearts. And that is interesting. There are similarities in that list, very much so. Evil thoughts, sexual morality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. Many of these derive directly from the Ten Commandments. You can take that. Oh, we just now. We just go back one. Do you want to be fine? Or back three, or whatever it is to be. It's fine. We need to note here that Paul is speaking of those who have a settled lifestyle of sinful behaviour that displeases God, happily going on sinning as the Apostle John describes it in his letter. So they're claiming to be a Christian, but they are acquiescing, living in a, a way that, within these kind of categories, that is not just a falling into sin, that they then repent of or forgiven and come back to God, which is part of the normal Christian life. That doesn't happen. They, they have come to accept that this is right, even though it's clear it's not. It's not those who struggle with wrong thoughts or desires or greed or with their speech or, or with drink or whatever it may be. And there are many like that. In fact, in a sense, it's all of us struggling against that sin that remains, isn't it? That is also part of the Christian life. And we seek God's grace and strength to live for him and please him in the midst of it, which can be costly, but it is God's way. We don't happily go on sinning. We seek God's forgiveness and grace to please him in Christ. Sinners saved by grace. So it's this settled lifestyle of sinful behavior, happily going on sinning that's in question here. People like the man earlier in the episode who was happily living in the relationship that was wrong with the rest of the church, accepting it. As Marion Sword says, this concerns those who would attempt both to be part of the church and to continue to live in a manner unworthy of the truth of the gospel. A foot in both camps as we've been singing, God calls us to be holy. The Spirit who came in Pentecost is the Holy Spirit. He calls us to holiness of life. The searching light of his truth and holiness shines into his church and our lives. And by his grace, by his Holy Spirit's power, he enables us in our weakness and sinfulness to be forgiven, to be coming more like Jesus, and living as a, in a way that pleases him. And we all know, even as I'm saying these words, you and I know how we fail. We know our weakness, don't we? So there's no judgmentalism here or superiority. This is all about wanting what God wants in our lives by his grace, by his spirit. But we come back to that strong challenge and you see, you, will, you see, as I say these things, what I mean about the clarity of Scripture and the challenge being to obey it. Hear the strong challenge. We are not to mix with such people, have prolonged contact, interaction, mingling. Those who call themselves Christians but are living in a settled sinful way. We as a church, now this is not speaking about our fam responsibilities in a marriage or family context or in other responsibilities we may have in work or whatever. This is as a church fellowship. We're not 
to have that prolonged regular contact or interaction, we're not to eat with them. It's broader than sharing communion, though that is no doubt included. Just put the first list back, the first three lists that came back up, Joe. Just looking at those things. The one thing that is on all lists is sexual immorality. We get criticized for talking about sex too much at times, but my goodness, it's a problem in our society. But it's not just that. Look at another one there, swindler. It appears in the second list and the third list. Back when I was an accountant, I attended a conference in People's Hydro. It was on inheritance tax. Um, and there was a speaker here, a fellow accountant, speaking very helpfully in the subject of inheritance tax and trusts or whatever it was at that point. I knew him to be a Christian and an elder in his church, so I had a word with him afterwards out in the sun in front of People's Hydro. We chatted about some issues arising from his talk and about our faith. I was amazed to discover not long afterwards that this man had been effectively defrauding people through some investment company he was involved in. Scandalous. The church he was involved in had to deal with this, which I understand was painful, particularly as he was part of a significant family in that church. Can you just imagine the dynamics of that? As far as those outside the church are concerned, there's to be engagement, whether they are moral or immoral, whoever they may be. As I said, just like Jesus, sinless and yet mixing with sinners. A friend of sinners. Like Jesus, we are to engage with people where they are so that they can meet with Jesus too. But as far as the church is concerned, inside the church, we are not to mix with those who are happily going on sinning while professing to belong to Jesus. Isn't that hugely challenging? That's for their sake too, to seek the repentance and restoration. It's for the sake of the church and her witness. It's for the sake of those outside the church so that they can see what the church really is. And it's for the sake of the Lord of the church for his glory. We're not to be separated from the world. We're not to be submerged in the world. We are to be engaged with the world in a distinctively Christian way. Distinctively Christian way. Here's how David Pryor helpfully puts these two sides of this thing. He says, the more thoroughly Christians who are distinctive mix with unbelievers, the less danger there is of moral compromise, especially if such witness is a corporate, compassionate, and clear testimony. It's good for us to be out there. Salt out of the salt shaker. Doing good in the world. Light. Salt and light. But he says, he goes on to say, equally, unbelievers are drawn more effectively into Christian communities where there is an unmistakable and translucent distinctiveness in the things that really count. You know, you hear much about having to be relevant in moral matters in the church so that young people will come along. David Robertson, whose uh, blog I look at regularly, um, heard uh, somebody from a church uh, saying this, you know, well, we've got to be relevant in these ways and keep up with the times in these moral matters so that there'll be children and young folk in the church. And he asked him, well, how many children and young folk do you have in your church? None. Um, so there was no evidence that that um, practice in that particular context was making any difference. Of course, not many ch there's children absent from many churches, of course. But I am struck that those churches which are growing, churches and cities particularly, the ones I have knowledge of that are growing and where young people are found, are those that hold firmly to the truth of God's word and lifestyle that seeks to please God in everything. We have need wisdom and discernment as we seek to apply what Paul is saying here. Are you finding this challenging? Stimulating? Uncomfortable? 
Not surprisingly, my thoughts turned to the General Assembly and the decision in relation to human sexuality, which was made there. Last time I spoke about the vote that was coming up, now that vote has been cast and the decision has been made. The Church of Scotland has agreed to same-sex wed same weddings being conducted by those ministers and deacons who wish to do so. It was interesting at the Assembly that a number of people spoke to me after the debate that I'd contributed to briefly. Some I didn't know, some unexpected, thanking me for speaking. Those who are prominent on the other side of the debate uh, didn't engage with me, uh, well, not that I engage with them as that happens. I don't see myself mixing socially with Scott Rennie. Um, as it happens, he's now moved from Aberdeen Queen's Cross Church to Crown Court Church in London just at the beginning of May. Paul is, of course, speaking here about those whose lives are not being lived in line with the truth of the gospel, Christians. Not with those who hold to teaching that seeks to make that behavior acceptable. <laughs> See the fine distinction there. Um, but of course, there is a, a close link between the two. Paul concludes with a reminder that judging the world is not our job, but God's. We are to love others and seek them and serve them and pray and work for their salvation and leave the outcome to God, who is perfectly just and loving. Coercion of any kind uh, towards faith is not God's way. But, says Paul, we are to judge those inside the church. That's what he says. Not to judge in terms of playing God. We don't know what's going on inside people. We don't know what, where they stand really in the end of the day. But we are to exercise discipline and bring challenge in relation to those things that are not right. It's a high calling. And the fact that we find this so foreign is, I think, indicative of the low level of spiritual life that there is sadly in the church. This action of not mixing, of not associating that Paul instructs here is designed to make it clear that everyone, to everyone what the church is. It's not an expression of pride or judgmentalism which have no place in the church. I'm deliberately not going into examples of how this might work out, but we need to be very clear that these are examples of people who claim to be Christians, but whose lifestyles seriously and clearly are in contradiction to what God wants from us as believers without any uh, desire, it seems, to change. Just a few practical thoughts on all this. Note that this teaching applies not just to larger churches like ourselves, but just as much with added clarity, in fact, to smaller Christian groups. House churches, for example, where relationships are closer and hiding things is harder. I'm hearing a few things, few people saying just from different sources at the moment. Uh, there's a desire being expressed to escape from the church as we know it, the kind of institutional church, and to find something freer and uh, more spontaneous in a, in a small group meeting in a house where things just happen, you know, and um, God is there. And you can see the attractiveness of that in some ways. But you know, in that small group, the same issues would arise as arise in any larger situation. Things we need to be dealt with. And if things arose that were problematic, it would be actually much harder to deal with it in a group of 10 or 5 than it would be in a larger situation. Just a thought. If we seek that kind of thing for ourselves, it might not work out quite as conducive and free <laughs> as we might imagine. And here's a topical question to ponder. If following Paul's instruction here becomes untenable, because of a general acceptance in the church of certain regular patterns of life which are displeasing to God, you know, if it's just accepted, well, how could we possibly put Paul's teaching into effect? You couldn't. Well, what do we do then? And here's a further topical issue. With the forthcoming amalgamations of churches that's coming up, with all the different cultures and expectations, ways of doing things, patterns of life. We will need to take care 
that we do not use a lowest common denominator approach. Right, so here's everyone and here's what they do. Here's their practice on baptism or here's their practice on this particular matter. And we'll find the one that suits everyone. We need to seek from the outset to shape the new church in line with God's word and his loving purposes for his church and his world. And that could be challenging, couldn't it? May God lead us on in the narrow and right way of Jesus Christ, his son. So to conclude, may we be a holy people in God's sight, knowing his grace when we fail, as we do and we will. But may we also exercise right discipline when that is required. And that, says Paul, will include, as a church, not having regular or prolonged contact and interaction with someone who claims to be a Christian, but whose settled manner of life seriously contradicts that. And as we said, we need wisdom and care in applying that in practice. And may we be like Jesus in our strong engagement, individually and as a congregation with those outside the church. That distinctiveness lived out in all the costliness of that in our town, in our living, in our work, in our families, in our various responsibilities, whatever it may be, that there we are as Christ's people to serve and love, to make Jesus known, to be salt and light there so they may come to know the Lord and his saving power and love and come to be part of his family too. May God bless these reflections on his word. Amen. Some moment of quiet before we come to prayer. Or as we come to prayer. Lord, pray you'll take your word to us this evening in all its challenge and enable us to work it out in practice the way you want it to be done. Direct, correct, enable us to live as pleases you. May your church be holy by your Holy Spirit's enabling, by your grace. May we know your ongoing forgiveness, power, and life, sanctifying work within us. Glory to you, Lord. We pray for your wisdom. We pray for the Kirkin this morning and all those who were there. Pray that the word spoken from your word will find a lodging in the hearts of minds of many who are there that it will continue, not be snatched away, but come back to them in such a way that it draws them closer to you, those who are not yet yours. And for those who do belong to you to be encouraged. Thank you, Lord. We pray for the Lee family, give you thanks for them. As we're hearing during the week, we give you thanks for your work in their lives. Pray for Sam, uh, who is taking on this interim director's role in the OMF Dutch office. Bless him and strengthen him, equip him for that significant role. And we give you thanks for the family who are all going on in their faith, doing well at school and university after their first year home, in home assignment. And we give you thanks especially for Lisa as we hear that her ankles that have given her pain for four years have been healed in answer to prayer by your power at the Christian camp she went to. Thank you, Lord, 
for that. So we ask your blessing continuing on that family in extended home assignment there in the Netherlands. Pray for our Queen. Give you thanks for her as this weekend comes to a conclusion, the Platinum Jubilee celebrations. We give you thanks for her years of dedicated, faithful giving of herself dutifully to the service of this country and the Commonwealth. And pray that you'll be with her in her, adv her advanced years, strength for what she needs to do. And we pray your blessing on her. We pray also for the future, for her, uh, for the succession. And we cry out specifically, Lord, that the Christian tone and leadership that has come from the Queen being there in that position will not be lost, that you will preserve that Christian heritage in our nation, whatever happens constitutionally in the future. We pray for Ukraine. Pray that you will bring peace there. Pray that you will frustrate wrong actions, that you will uh, intervene in surprising ways. May you be known there. May you strengthen and bless your church in that place. And we pray for lasting peace. And we, Lord, we pray for the praise gathering, what I has brought to our attention again this evening. May that be well attended. May there be those there invited along who will hear the praise and the gospel message and their lives will be changed as a result of it. Bless that time, we pray. And now, Father, in a moment of quiet, we bring our personal concerns to you. Lord, hear all our prayers. Pray for your blessing on us in our lives this coming week. Pray for you to bless the remainder of this day in quietness, protection, good night's sleep, readiness for all that lies ahead, safety in travel for those who do so for power to serve you, to trust you. Pray for those who are sad or sick, that you'll be with them. Lord, heal all our, all our prayers, so bring them in Jesus' name. Now let's say the Lord's Prayer together, which should come up on the screen. We should know. Anyway. Our Father, who are in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Just remember to say that the Thy Kingdom Come, the prayer reminded me of it. The prayer room is still open this evening, so if you've got a moment as you go out, just pop in, spend five minutes if you, if you could, and um, you'll see the various stations there if you haven't already done so. And thanks to Joe for setting that up and arranging the various prayer meetings over the last 10 days. It's on there, that's right. We're going to, let's respond now really on this day of Pentecost uh, as we 
remain seated and sing this, this lovely song. Um, so Michael the Belfry Choir and Singers, it's on a video. Breathe on me, Spirit of Jesus. grace to one another. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forevermore. Amen. of God shall 